Now, a couple weeks ago, uh, I was going to a friend's house, Brian's house, for lunch. And I, it's been a while since I've been to Brian's house. And as I drove down the lane here at church to, to go, I, I, I just realized that I don't remember how to get to his house. Anybody ever have a moment like that? <laughs> Those moments are happening more and more, you know. I, some days I can't find my way home. So I pulled out my GPS, an old GPS that was in the, trunk, in, the, in, the, in the glove box of the car, and I typed it in, and the GPS was old enough that it didn't have the address, but it had like the general vicinity, so I thought, okay, I can, I can start. And then, then I, so I got my phone out, and I thought, okay, I'll take my phone, I'll take the GPS, and, and it's a newer development, so the, uh, the, the directions weren't very clear, and I thought, okay, I think I, think I can get there, but, but my phone gave me a shortcut. Now, I should have known, because I'm used to going a certain way, and, you know, I probably could have found his house if I went the same way, but I decided, you know, I can cut off 10 minutes of this drive if I just take the shortcut. So I, I made my way, and I began to, to drive down. I got about halfway down. I got into the Hudson, Hudson Road area back in there, and, and in that quadrant, for some reason, I just don't know the roads like, like I know the other roads around here. And I kept going, and, I, and the more I was driving, the more lost I realized I was, and then all of a sudden, my GPS started talking to me. It's not good when your GPS starts saying, recalculating now. <laughs> Turn left now. And I'm like, that's not the way to his house. I don't know where I'm going. And so I, so I stopped alongside the road to look at my phone, and, and, I, and I reoriented myself. I said, okay, I'm going to follow the phone. So the phone started taking me a direction. Then the phone started talking to me about going another direction, and the GPS was telling me to go the other direction. Now, in my type A-ism, I began to get a little bit hot under collar. Can anybody relate? I began to get a little uptight because now I didn't leave enough margin to get to my friend's house on time, and I hate being late. So I kept driving, and I got lost and lost, and finally I decided to pull off the road. I had this GPS and the phone telling me what to do, and so I did what anybody that's a good Christian would do is I began to call upon my wife's name. I called Patty. I said, Patty, I'm lost. I don't know where I'm going. I got this GPS. I need you to go on the computer and look at the map and tell me where I am and tell me how to get there. And, and so she began to give me directions. And finally, I finally got clear enough directions so I could make myself, make my way to my friend's house who, who had just had had knee surgery and he was there cooking me lunch. And I'm like feeling really, now I really feel bad because my friend's hobbling on one leg. He's been waiting. He's 10 minutes. I'm 10, 15 minutes late, and he's making me lunch, and he's hobbling on crutches, and, and I just feel like a heel. Can anybody say amen? amen. You're not supposed to say, oh, no, Pastor Bob. <laughs> Culturally, this is where we find ourselves. Right now in the culture, we have a lot of different voices that are trying to give us directions, trying to tell us how to live our lives, how to go, where to go, how to go, what life's about, what we should do. It, and it gets quite confusing and very perplexing. Who do you follow? Which one is right? What do we do about this? We've been in a series called The Significance of the Sacred. We're looking at difficult stories in the Bible to try to make sense of them and get direction for our lives. And, and so far, we've seen that holy things or sacred things always have three things that are true about them. First, they belong to God. They're His. Secondly, God has a special purpose or a special use for those things. And thirdly, He has special directions on how you should handle them. Now, when we use the word holy, we get all kinds of ideas in our head, like holier than now, we've talked about that. But one of the ideas that gets in our head, when you hear the word holy now, most people think you're weird. When people hear the word holy, they think of, my uncle, of the Uncle Junior, my brother. I got a picture of my brother. And when people hear the word holy, sacred, this is what they think of. That's my brother Junior. No, he doesn't really look like that. He's much uglier. <laughs> actually, I'm from a very good-looking family. He actually looks pretty normal like I do. Here's a picture of my family growing up. <laughs> now, when we think of holy, I hate to tell you guys, when, the, when we talk about sacred things in our culture, people are really thinking, they're thinking conehead. They're thinking, they, they don't have, the, our culture today does not have an understanding or even a significance or even a, a, a remote idea of what we're talking about 
When we talk about sacred things from the Bible, they're getting it from cultural information, and our culture has lost the significance of the sacred. And if we're going to understand Bible stories and we're going to get the lessons out of the scriptures that those stories are intended to communicate to our lives, we really have to begin to, to understand and appreciate more what sacred is really about. Over the last couple of weeks, we've learned a couple of lessons. We looked at the life of Uzzah, who touched the ark, who had good intentions, but we saw that good intentions in life and in sacred things are not always enough. And we looked at Samson's life, and we saw last week, which really kind of blew me away, is that, that sacred things are critical if we're going to connect to one another. This morning, we're going to look at another person's life, a man named Saul. And we're going to see that God has another message for us to share. And the message is going to be this. I'm going to tell you the message, and I'm going to unpack it a little bit. And here's the message. When all else fails, pray. Read the directions, and then pray. Read the directions. A couple of weeks ago, I was putting a shop back together because my shop back died, and I got another shop back. And I looked, and I took the box apart, and it had the directions taped to the top, and I said, oh, I can do this myself. I'm smart enough. I got a college degree, so I took the directions and threw them somewhere. And I did pretty well until I got to the end, and there was one piece I could not figure out how they were putting that piece on. And I finally did what men reluctantly do is I went to the directions and I found out how to do it. Folks, the Bible is not just a bunch of stories about dusty religious stuff. The Bible is a book about directions. It's a book that gives us directions on how to live life. And the stories that are there, they're in a different cultural context. So we have to do some translation into our culture. But when you go back into these stories, you learn who God is and we learn how to live life. The Bible itself is a sacred book. It's different than any other book on the planet in fact, missiologist Leslie Newbin, he wrote often about encounters with people, and he wrote about an encounter with a Hindu scholar. A Hindu scholar. He's a very religious man who challenged him with these words. He said, I can't understand why you missionaries present the Bible to us in India as a book of religion. Did you hear me, church? I can't understand. This is a very religious man saying, I don't understand why you present the Bible as a book of religion. It's not a book of religion. And anyway, he says, we have plenty of books on religion in India. We don't need any more. He said, I find in your Bible a unique interpretation of universal history, the history of the whole of creation and the history of the whole human race. That is unique. That's what sacred means. Sacred means unique, special. There's none like it. It's got a different purpose. It's different, but different in a good kind of way. And one of the ways that the Bible is different is that the Bible was given to us to give us directions when we get lost, to get directions when we're confused. When there's multiple sources of direction that are telling you how to live your life, there is one book you can go to that will always be safe to get directions from. It's safe now. It was safe 100 years ago. It was safe 500 years ago. It was safe 305,000 years ago, whatever years ago it was. I got my numbers mixed up. And a thousand years from now, if Jesus doesn't return, it'll be safe. Meanwhile, your GPS, if you don't update that sucker very often. One time my wife and I were traveling and we were following the GPS. We were following the directions and it took us to a field. There was nothing there. And my wife, being the spiritual giant that she is, said, I don't think this is where we're supposed to go. <laughs> I hadn't figured it out yet. I was going to turn in on that field. I'm like, it's got to be a back way in somewhere. She's like, no, I don't think I'd do that, Bob. Remember that? <laughs> I listened to her. Today's text we come from, will be taken from 1 Samuel chapter 4. In this text, there's four statements that are made about the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant is the most holy, sacred object in the land of Israel at the time. There, there is nothing more sacred 
than the ark. And there's four statements in this chapter that really summarize the whole story, and it's the point that God's trying to make because what we're going to see is that nowhere in this story does anybody stop and read the directions. And they get more lost and more lost. We pick it up in 1 Samuel chapter 4. It says, now, and the word of Samuel. Samuel is the, is the first of the prophets uh, in the, after the time of the judges. And God is doing a transition in the government and in the nation to bring Israel to a better place. And, and Samuel is a young boy, and he's ministering to a guy named Eli. And in chapter 3, if you'd read the story, you can go home and read that story. The Lord just revealed himself to a young Samuel. He's probably five, six years of old, six years of age. And Samuel is known now to be a prophet. God spoke to him directly and began to give him instruction. And the word of Samuel is beginning to spread. People are beginning to hear that God is giving direction. It's very important. God is giving directions to his people through a man named Samuel, a boy named Samuel. Now, Israel went out to battle against the Philistines. Does anybody remember who I said the Philistines are? They're like the Vikings, the Vikings of that day. They're marauding, marauding and till, pillaging, and they're encamped beside Ebenezer. Remember we sing that song, I raised my Ebenezer? That's where it comes from. And the Philistines encamped in Aphek. Then the Philistines put themselves in battle or in array against the Israelites. And when they joined in battle, Israel was defeated by the Philistines who killed about 4,000 men of the army in the field. And when the people had come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Now, let me just stop right there. Here's what's happening. Israel goes out to battle and they get their butts kicked. 4,000 men die in battle. That's a major defeat. Can anybody say amen? They get beat bad. They're in defeat. And so now, because they're losing the battle, they're doing what men don't do. They're asking for directions. You know men don't ask for directions. I, I actually Googled men asking for directions. I was looking for an article on Google that would refute the assumption that men don't ask for directions. I could not find one. I went page after page after page. Nobody said, newsflash, men ask for directions. Nobody did that. The assumption is men don't ask for directions, which makes me look at this story and say, it must be pretty bad because a group of men are asking for directions. 4,000 of them have been killed. Word of Samuel now is, is beginning to permeate, and Israel's starting to ask, okay, God's raising up a prophet. He's giving directions. Why did God let us lose? It looks like things should be good because we got this guy Samuel here who's hearing from God again. And so they ask for direction. So the elders come up with a bright idea. The leaders. Pray for leaders because sometimes leaders just don't know what they're doing. Let us bring the Ark of the Covenant. Here's phase, phrase number one. Let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from Shiloh. Shiloh is a tabernacle some 20 to 30 miles away from where they are, and they had to go through mountains and hills. It's not like they just went over across the street and got the ark. This thing's 20 to 30 miles by foot. Let us bring the ark from Shiloh to us that when it comes among us, it may save us from the hand of our enemies. And so the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord of hosts who dwells between the cherubim. On top of the ark, I should have put a picture up there, but I didn't, but I think everybody's seen Indiana Jones. They have two cherubim on top of it, and they're looking inwards. And literally, they didn't really go between. What would happen is the presence of God would come down upon those cherubim in physical form, and God would manifest His Shekinah glory. And it was symbolic of His throne. This was His throne. God would make His throne amongst the people. And they're saying, man, we got to go get the ark. we got to bring God into the camp with us. Now, let me just say something about their advice. It's bad advice. It's like my GPS saying or my phone saying, i got a shortcut for you, Pastor Bob. And they're going to take this advice. But in this advice, they're going to violate all three things that we know about the sacred. First of all, we've said sacred things belong to God. They have a special use, and they have special instructions. They're going to violate all three. Taking the ark into battle would be treating the ark as if it's their own. Bad idea. 
taking the ark into battle would be using it the way they think it needs to be used, not the way that it's described to be used in the Bible, which is a book of directions. Taking the ark into the battle would violate the instructions on how it was to be handled. And as I started this series, I said, when Uzzah touched the ark, he should have left it alone. And last week we saw that that Samson should have not played with the sacred. Today they should have read the directions and find out what wisdom and advice they were getting, whether it was good or not. Folks, here's what I want you to hear this morning. When you go out of here, you're going to turn your radios on, and you're either going to put music on, or you're going to put news on, or you're going to put something on, and people are going to start telling you how to live your life. We have got to return to this book as the source of direction. How do you know what you're hearing and, and, and seeing and being told is actually good advice or not? It's called discernment. And one of the things that gets lost in a culture or in the church even, when we begin to lose the significance of the sacred is we learn the, we, this, we unlearn or we lose the ability to discern between right and wrong, good and evil, a good course of action, good directions and bad directions. And so the first thing that happens is they get beat and they say, you know what, we really need, it sounds like a good thing. They did a good thing. They're looking and saying, Lord, what's wrong? Why did we lose? That's a good question. But then the elders come right in and say, let me tell you why. We just need to take the ark with us into battle. And then it goes on to say in verse 5, and when the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into camp, so they followed the advice. They followed bad directions. And they're going to end up just as lost as I did on my way to my friend Brian's. They take the advice. They travel 20 to 30 miles. That's a 40 to 60 mile round trip. I didn't do all the, you know, I could have figured it out exactly, but I just kind of guesstimated on the map. That's a long trip, folks, by hand. They had to carry the ark. Can you imagine walking 60 miles with something on your shoulders? That's what they had to do. I can't, I can't walk across the, you know, the, the, the living room to get the remote. That's what you got kids for, right? And if the grandkids are over there, you make a game out of it. Jason, hey, Jason, hey, man, let's play a game. See that little thing right there? Why don't you go get it and bring it back to Grandpa? <laughs> Here's what they're really going to do. Are you ready? The leaders and the people will follow the directions of the culture around them. Culture is like water. It's all around us. And I, I've had people tell me, you know, oh, culture doesn't affect me. Yes, it does. It affects all of us. And all of culture is not bad. There's good things in culture, there's neutral things in culture, and then there's bad things in culture. But it affects us all. We are impacted in our decision-making by culture. For instance, all of us are consumers because American culture is consumer-oriented. And so we're all influenced by culture, and that's not all bad. But what can happen when we're looking for directions in our lives, we can begin to lean towards getting directions and not looking through the lens of Scripture to understand what God's telling us to do. John Stone Street says uh, in one of his books, he says, he quotes an ancient Chinese proverb to a group of high school students. He says, if you know, want to know what water is, don't ask the fish. Then I asked the students, why shouldn't you ask the fish? Now, some smart aleck student replied, because the fish can't talk. He said, no, the correct answer is that fish don't know they're wet. In one sense, of course, there's nothing fish know more than water. But the proverb points out the difficulty of understanding our own environment, the one in which we are completely immersed in and take for granted as normal. Culture is for humans is what water is to fish. The environment we live in and think in is normal. The main difference is, unlike fish, we make our own environments. That's why I think every one of you should take a mission trip at whatever level your body will let you. Every one of us need to get outside of the American culture because when you step on a plane and once you step off the plane and you get into a different culture, it will take you 30 seconds to recognize that you are not in Kansas anymore. It's a different world out there. People think different. They act different. What's normal to them is different. Gestures that we would make can be offensive to them, and their, their gestures could be offensive to us. And you have to, and you realize, and then you begin to realize that there's a lot of culture. 
many cultures because they're ag agrarian they don't even think about buying a car i'm thinking about buying a car i want to know what color it is i want to know what the payment's going to be those are things that are cultural and there's no good or evil about them they're just real Israel was succumbing at this time in history to the pressure of the culture around them, and they had adopted new definitions of normal. Hear me, church, because it's what we're facing. When we go outside these doors, people are telling us what's normal. They're telling us what's good. They're telling us what's right. And so they acted, Israel begins to act like the Philistines. They, the Philistines were a pagan culture, polytheistic culture, and they would not think of going into battle without their gods. And so when Israel gets defeated, their thinking process is, hey, we need to go get our god. We need to go get the ark, and we need to take the ark in the battle. The only problem with this is they're not following the directions given in the Bible. They're following the dictates of the culture and what's normal. They had seen for hundreds of years that the way the enemy went into battle and they were getting their butts kicked is the way they, they go into battle is they bring their gods with them. So they began to get the idea, why don't we bring our God, singular, with us? And they began to treat the sacred like it was common. They began, because the common thing to do was to grab your idol and carry that thing in the battle. And you say, oh, great God, great God, great God, win my victory for me. And now Israel's doing the same thing. And you'll find that, and i got to speed up, but if you read this text, you'll find in the next few verses, it says when they bring the ark into the camp that the roar was so loud, they got so jacked up about it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's pretty good. Should be in a movie. But a physique like this ought to be. You know, hey, by the way, if you've not seen the Avengers, I can now say I look like Thor. I'll leave that to you. Those who've seen it know what I'm talking about. Don't I look like Thor? <laughs> Glory to God. I do. I ain't stretching the truth right there. You have to go see it. Where was I? They brought their God, and everybody's getting excited and jacked up. And then it says in the next few verses that when the Philistines heard them, they're two miles away, by the way. You talk about excited. They could hear them two miles away over the hills, over the river and through the woods like the grandmother's house. Two miles away. They could, they're so excited. And the Philistines say, man, we're in trouble. They have brought their God into camp with them. This is the God. These are the gods. Read the story that defeated the Egyptians, and they came out in the history. They began to tell each other what the Bible says about what God did in Egypt and all the deliverance, and they're scared. And so they come up with some instructions on their own. Their leaders say, hey, unless you want to be their slaves, you better buckle up and let's go fight these dudes with everything we got in them because if we don't do that, we're going to lose and we're going to become their servants. Read the story. Israel is acting like the Philistines, and the Philistines are acting like the Philistines. And so the Israelites follow the directions, and we pick it up in verse, let's see, verse, mm, verse 10. So the Philistines fought. So they go into battle, and Israel was defeated. And every man fled to his tent, and there was a very great slaughter, and there fell of Israel 30,000 foot soldiers. Now, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. They got defeated before, and they said, let, they got a bright idea. Let's, let's, they got directions. Why don't you take a shortcut and bring the ark into your camp with you, and that'll make sure we get victory. And they lost 4,000 originally. Now they're losing 30,000. Can anybody say they're getting any worse? They're getting worse? They're getting more lost, just like I was, trying to follow multiple sources of direction. I was getting more lost and more lost and more lost. And I would say to the church, now, I'm not saying this to everybody in our culture, but I'm saying to Christians, right now we're at a season where we got to begin to return back to the book for directions, or we're going to get lost. There are multiple streams giving you advice and wisdom for how you to live your life. And the only thing you can trust, and we've trusted as followers of Christ for 2,000 years, is the Word of God. I'm not saying we're going to agree on everything that it says. I'm not saying that. But I mean as the filter to judge and discern whether a set of directions is healthy for you or not. I don't like these results. 
going from 4,000 losses to 30,000. I think I would, if I came into a meeting and I was going to, to, to evaluate those decision-making processes, I think I'd come up with a different idea. Things got worse. But not only did they lose 30,000 men, it goes on to say, and also the ark of God was captured. They lost the most significant sacred object in the nation. Now, how would you like to be the guy that has to go tell them that? I remember years ago, I needed to chop some wood, and, and my, my axe, it was broken. And so I decided that I was going to borrow my father's axe. And John McTernan was with me, because this is back when I lived in Del Mar. John McTernan is our facilities director, and I, was, and I asked John, John was going to help me. And so I said, now John, I literally said this, now John, I'm going to go borrow my father's axe. I said, now we got to make sure that nothing happens to this axe, because if something happens to this axe, I'll never hear it down. Will I, Anna? And so I said, because the way my dad is with his tools, and he's never trusted me with his tools, and if, he'll let me borrow it, but I said, if anything happens at all, I'll hear it forever. So we went and we borrowed the axe, and Dad said, now, Robert, make sure you don't do anything, don't hit it on it, and all that stuff, that instructions, because, you know, like, a $20 axe is really valuable. And I'm not lying. I am not exaggerating. John, if you're, where's John? John, are you here? Where, John's around here somewhere. He's probably doing something in the building, but he's in here somewhere. He'll tell you this is what happened. Literally, I literally went back to swing like this, the axe head fell off. <laughs> I, I had a witness. Glory to God, I got a witness. I looked at John and said, this isn't going to be good. So we drove back down to my dad's house. I walk in the door. What do you think the first thing he said was? You broke it, didn't you? <laughs> I said, no, 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 no. 30 minutes lecture on how to take care of tools. What I should have done is gone down broken because it, it was dark, broke in Brian Brings and stole an ax, brought it to dad and spent three years in prison because it would have been easier. Because <laughs> the ax was holy. It was his. It had a special use to sit in the garage and look good. And he had special instructions for handling it and I violate. He thought I violate. I really was innocent. I was Uzzah. I had good intentions. I really didn't touch it, but it got broken. <laughs> and I heard about that for years. How would you have felt if you're responsible for the ark? It'd be like having the Declaration of Independence in your house. And you lose it. Watch what happened. This is the fourth statement. Now, when he came, and then a man from Benjamin ran, verse 12, from battle line the same day and came to Shiloh with his clothes torn and dirt on his head. That's kind of how I approached my dad. Torn shirt, dirt on my head, mourning. Now, when he came, there was Eli. Eli's the high priest. He's the one responsible for the ark, sitting on a seat by the wayside, watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And the story unfolds that he tells Eli that the ark was captured. And Eli, after hearing the news, fell back off his chair and broke his neck and died. Now here's the thing about the story I'm trying to bring out. Eli was probably the only one in that whole group of people that ever read the directions. And his heart trembled because he knew the leaders were not doing what the direction said to do. And so he knew that they were in trouble and he said nothing. That's why, if you go back to chapter 3, the Lord told Eli that he was going to remove him and his family from the priesthood. He's going to take him out of leadership. Because they refused to do what's right in the eyes of the Lord. And what was culturally happening was people were doing what was right in their own eyes. And the Lord was trying to bring the people of God out of that 
way of thinking back to thinking the way he has, would have them think and to value what he would value and have them to call normal what he calls normal. Now hear me, church. We are living in America in a day where normal is being redefined. And we have to decide when we come out of these, but look, I have no problem. Somebody gets mad at me and says, Pastor Bob, I think you're a religious fanatic, bigot. I really don't have a problem with that anymore. I've chosen how I'm going to live. Even Christians. I've had Christians get on my case. Oh, you know, you're just too uptight. Well, I am uptight, but it's not because of that. We have to start deciding in the house of God where we're going to get our instructions and our definitions of normal. And don't expect it to be popular out there. And you don't have to go fanatical and get holier than now and go tell people and preach to people. I'm just, I was telling my wife, we were talking about this week, I said, you know what, I'm just going to love people where they are. Love them where they are. I'm not trying to change anybody. I'm just going to love them. If they ask me, I'm going to tell them what I think. But normal is more than a setting on your hair dryer. And if we follow the wrong directions, we're going to get lost. I'm going to preach on this in the next couple months, a message I'm really fired up about. But I think that there is a move of God coming, but it's going to be a back to the Bible movement. If you don't get hooked in this, we're going to be all over the place. Because we all have our, own, we have our own thoughts on many subjects, but if I took on any subject, got everybody up here, if there's 400 people here, 300 people here, every, 300 different ideas, and when there's all kinds of sources telling you what to do, you got to go back to his directions, because that is what Christians do. Look, I'm no better than anybody else. I'm no, no more holy than anybody else. That's why I'm pointing you to the book. But one thing I'm not going to do is sit there like Eli and say, hey, just use the sacred thing any way you want. And his heart trembled because whenever you're worshiping an idol, whenever you're worshiping an idol, you will fear for your religion. It will bring anxiety into your life. When I'm trusting, really trusting the living God, it's amazing how calm I get. But when I'm trying to force it on my own, make an idol, choose to believe what I want to believe, it doesn't bring me peace and it won't bring you peace either. And you'll see all through the Bible, the message God kept telling his people is don't make up what I'm like. Listen to who I am. Because if you make it up and you make him into your image and likeness, which is what an idol is, it will bring you, your heart will tremble. And folks, we have an anxiety crisis in America. There is anxiety everywhere, and God is trying to minister to us. So what he's going to do is he's going to bring us back to the sacred and say, look, I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm trying to make you feel good. And the first thing that has to happen, you've got to begin to distinguish. There's things that are sacred, and there are things that are common, and God's word is sacred. I read it to you. Even religious scholars around the world will tell you the Bible is different. Stop trying to make it like everything else. That's what scholars are doing today. Let's make this book like every other book. It's just a bunch of people wrote their own opinions. That's what new theology is today. That's wrong. That book is different. Learn it. Even if you don't agree with it, learn it at least so you know where you are. There's all the other ideas, and then there's God's idea. If you want peace in your life, and you want direction you can trust, can I tell you, I just confess to you publicly, there are things in here I wish weren't in here. I wish God would let me get away with some things. Come on, don't look at me so self-righteous and say holy, but I messed up my whole sermon. I'm not preaching at you. Folks, I'm making decisions in my own life. I'm going to build this church on that book and try to rightly divide it as best I can. I'm going to build my life on that book. And when I'm wrong, when I'm the guy that's wrong, I'm going to say, I'm right. I mean, I'm right. I'm wrong. (laughs) Freudian slip there. (laughs) 
If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. And if you want direction in your life, you have to get to a place where you are secure enough with God to say, God, you love me. I don't live up to this. Because he'd say to you, the reason I'm letting you see that stuff is so you'll come to me and not get this thing all screwed up. Because there's a lot of voices out there. And I want to direct your life to a path of peace. Let's just wrap this all back together. God wants us to have peace in our lives. An idol, wrong directions, given out of good intentions will still bring your life into a place of disaster. You'll still get lost. You'll still get perplexed. Even if the directions are given, they, these people in the story, they had good intentions for the directions they gave. They really believed what they were saying. You don't think they said, let's take the ark into battle. And I don't believe it'll work. They believed what they were saying, just like people in our culture believe what they're saying. But it doesn't mean the directions were good. Stand with me. Father, You're not trying to make us self-righteous or weird. You're trying to give us peace. And just one of the several things that you do, and there's several things you do in a season where we're at, the influence is on our lives. And Father, some of the things are in and of themselves are neutral, like the phone and the TV and the radio and you know, the internet, all that stuff, Lord, in and of itself is not bad. But, Lord, now we have multiple voices that are influencing us. And my prayer for this church and your church throughout the world and this country is that we begin to listen to your voice and seek your voice, which sometimes, Lord, will contradict our own voice. There are times, Lord, where I want to go left and you want me to go right. And, Lord, we have a decision to make. But Lord, when we begin to go your way, the peace begins to return because you're not looking for perfection. You really aren't. You've provided for our imperfection. You've provided for our rebellion and our resistance and our stubbornness. You've provided for our waywardness. You've provided for our weakness. Lord, we're all weak and we're all frail. But Lord, the starting point of peace is just getting honest with ourselves and beginning to align what we understand about directions up with your word and so help us to do that lord and help no one misconstrue anything i've said i don't mean to be hard i'm trying to help people and lord when all else fails and all else is failing all else is failing today lord we need to read your directions and we need to follow them Father, help us to live that way, not in a spirit of legalism, but in a spirit of grace and freedom and to know and receive your love. We ask this in Jesus' name. And everybody said?